Hello and welcome everyone to yet another stream of Network Programmability Lab. This is Dmitry um, and today we are going to talk about Cisco NSO. So I'm very excited about this stream in particular um, because I have been uh, wanting to learn NSO for quite a while now uh, and I didn't have any chance. Um, so I'm really excited to get some hands-on experience with this. I have shown a couple of demos before and I had a bunch of one-on-one -on -one discussions so I know exactly why I need it, but I didn't have any kind of hands-on experience yet. So I decided that would be a great idea to actually share my learning journey with you guys uh, live on the stream. Uh, so, before we will jump into uh, Cisco NSO and I will start telling you about it and then we will jump into all CLI and all that stuff. Um, let's, let's, uh, well usually at the beginning of the, of every stream I have like small vlog part um, that, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about what, what happened during this week's. So we didn't have a stream for, I think, three weeks now. So uh, three weeks passed since the last stream. And the reason why is because I was in the US and we had a Cisco Live US in in Orlando. Uh, great, great event, great, great experience. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I had so much fun, but it was also extremely exhausting. Um, the main reason why I had a bunch of sessions where I, where I was a speaker, so uh, so yeah, there was a lot of prep and well, yeah, it was just quite quite exhausting. I didn't have any chance to actually attend any other sessions or even go around world of solutions. Uh, mostly between sessions, I had you know maybe. 30 minutes or sometimes hour where I just you know go around and I stumble upon someone I know and then have a discussion and then oops it's already time for my next session uh, so regardless it was a really great experience uh, for the next Cisco life I decided that I'm not going to do as many sessions as I did this time it was just just a little bit too much one or two sessions would be would be enough so that I could go around and actually enjoy the event myself uh, and to have more time for for talking to people and meeting new people and seeing what other uh, what what partners and um, customers are doing and presenting in world of solutions and in demnet zone and all of that stuff uh, so um, there was another event just before Cisco Live in Orlando, and this is Devnet Express. So Devnet Express is two-day event organized by Devnet. It's completely free, and the main idea is to introduce uh, people to network programmability and uh, what Cisco has to offer in this area. Uh, so um, this time you had digital network architecture track, with content for which. Uh, I and some of my colleagues in sales and some DevNet people were writing back in April in Ohio. So this was the first uh, ever delivery of the new content uh, live. I think it went, went great. Uh, we had a lot of great uh, feedback. If you haven't had a chance to join DevNet Express, make sure you do. Um, if you're interested, obviously, network programmability, uh, there are a bunch of events going on around the world almost almost every week there are at least two or three in some nearby cities so uh, check the calendar on devnet website find the one closest to you uh, and and make, make sure you attend and have some fun it's really focused mostly on hands-on more than so obviously there is some kind of lecture slash presentation part but it's extremely short and the main focus is actually on our attendees to, to do some hands-on. So, uh, strongly encourage you to join if you if you hadn't uh, if you haven't done this before. 
Um, okay, so a couple of words about my sessions, uh, well, at least about one of them. So uh, among all of the sessions, there was one that um, I was the most excited about and uh, it was about it, it was called make your application make your Python applications faster with iSyncIO and this this uh, presentation is the first time ever iSyncIO was delivered at Cisco Live and the first time ever it is uh, presented on any kind of conference in the networking con context so I was very excited to see the feedback to understand if this is something interesting to people um, did have some some good feedback um, and I actually think that I'm going to submit the session for other conferences maybe interop or maybe inoc um, so yeah I'm really looking forward to the future conferences let's see if this talk is going to be accepted um, another important piece of Cisco life is obviously people uh, have I met so many great people, some some of them I knew before, some of them I didn't, some of them I knew only via Twitter or some other social media or router gods networking community. So uh, Cisco Life is, is really great that way. So a lot of a lot of great people and great engineers are coming in one place and you actually have a chance to hang out and talk to each other. Um, I had a bunch of photos from the event, probably I had one of the biggest archive uh, of photos with people, so um, if you're interested in that, make sure you check out my Twitter account, all photos are there. Um, there were a couple of other things that I was doing, so I had a chance to to be interviewed by, um, by DevNet, so this interview is going to be uh, it's still in, in post-production right now, uh, but it's going to be posted very soon on um, social media um, and YouTube and all that stuff. Uh, it was basically about my network programmability experience and my engagement with DevNet. Um, Another thing is that I participated in uh, IT Inquisition. This is a new show. Uh, new show by John Welsh, the host of Engineering Does Much. Um, it, it's the idea here is that it's a rapid quiz on some networking topics. This time it was routing and switching. And you know, the idea is that you have to answer them um, very fast and correct. I didn't, I didn't win and I realized how much I already forgot from my RS knowledge. I remember myself just before CCA exam, I was extremely strong in all of, all of that trivia and not only trivia in RS. Now I feel like I lost a lot of that knowledge, but honestly, that that's okay. My focus right now is network programmability, so um, I'm not extremely concerned about it. Um, that said, I do have to recertify my RS because it expires next month, so, well, I have to put some effort in order to do that because I forgot a lot of stuff. And another thing that I did was uh, me and Quentin, um, also known as the Land Tamer, uh, my streamer colleague who is uh, who has almost daily streams um, where he discusses some networking topics and his routing and switching CCERS uh, journey. So we did a live stream together at Cisco Live. So um, we were doing it on his YouTube channel. Let me pull it up if you're interested. It's very short, it's like 10 minutes long. So if you go to YouTube and you put the lawn timer and uh, here is this 14 minutes uh, Cisco Live wrap up. We did it on the last day of Cisco Live and I think it was, it was uh, I had a lot of fun with this uh, stream. Uh, interesting experience and Quentin is, is a great guy. Make sure you check out his uh, his Twitch channel as well. Uh, okay, so moving on from Cisco Live, 
Uh, and also see if there are a couple of questions in the chat. I will get back to them once I uh, once I finish these topics that I would like to to share with you. So um, another very important thing is that uh, the presentations page on my website is going to be updated today, uh, maybe maybe around like one hour or two hours after the stream. So uh, just to show you what I mean. So if you go to my web page, I have presentations page and right now it's extremely small. So I did a lot of work to first move my presentations to different place and also make sure to list all of my speaking engagements ever on this page. So um, it's, it's a big update. There are going to be at least 10 or 15 different items here. Also, there is, there is going to be posted one presentation that I didn't post before, but I had it, I had it on my computer. I just you know didn't have chance to go through it and prepare to be consumed by by public. Uh, so because I was revamping this page, I also did some 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 work to to prepare that presentation as well. So it's about IPsec and site-to-site -site VPN. If this is a topic that you need some quick reference or something, uh, this presentation is going to be published as well today. So major rewind for this web page. Make sure you check it out if you're interested in in my presentations, my speaking engagements, and all this stuff. Um, another one is that I'm in the process of writing a blog post, uh, getting started started with Python. Maybe maybe I will change the name a little bit. Um, I don't know yet. Uh, the the idea behind this blog post is that this is the most frequent question I get. Like, how do I get started with Python? Hi, I'm, I'm network engineer. I would like to learn Python. Um, where do I get started? So I. Uh, I got bored of getting this question all over again and well, sorry, not getting this question, but answering it. Uh, and some, sometimes it also being, uh, it's being asked on Twitter where you can't really put uh, everything you would like to share in one tweet because there is just not enough space. So I decided, okay, I'm going to write a, uh, write a blog post on this. It's going to take some time because I really want it to be good and to list all of things that come to my mind when I would, I would, uh, I would help someone get started with Python. So, but this is a work in progress. I do hope I will finish it soon. Uh, okay, I think we are done with most of the announcements. There are a couple of questions that uh, I saw. Uh, how was PyCon? PyCon was great. I this was my first PyCon ever. Uh, I had really great experience there. Um, it's very different compared to Cisco Life, but I also learned a lot. And I already I'm already using some of the tools that I learned at PyCon in my daily work. Um, so I really encourage other people to to go to PyCon if you have a chance. Otherwise, at least watch watch presentations uh, on YouTube. Uh, last time, um, last time, uh, last stream, I actually had a section in my vlog on uh, it's the beginning where I was discussing my PyCon experience, or maybe it was actually two streams before. I don't remember. Uh, you could check check it out, and I had a links for every session that I recommended. Uh, from PyCon, uh, so like my top five or something. So make sure you check that out. Uh, another question is, uh, I am really interested in Cisco and so is there a public eval version? Great question. Um, so uh, just, just a small disclaimer, I am, even though I'm working for the companies that produce an SO product, I'm not in, in well, I have nothing to do with them. They're part of service provider. They're part, part of service provider business group. I work in enterprise. So whatever I say today, not only it 
reflects only my personal opinion but also I may not know something uh, or everything um, so uh, yeah so just make sure so basically if I say like okay this is not available it doesn't mean that it's actually true mainly because I am not 100% sure so going back to your question is there a public eval version as far as I know there isn't However, uh, the DevNet uh, and okay. Before I answer the question, let me also turn on the light because okay, should be much better now. Um, okay, so um, um, however, the DevNet and uh, some folks from Sales were working uh, together on putting um, the Cisco NSO sandbox. Uh, that is available for everyone without any any uh, well you don't have to pay for it basically so if I go to I'm not 100% sure this is correct link but if you look on the Google for DevNet and so you will end up on this page this is developer Cisco com site and so page and at the very bottom there is uh, this page sandboxes on NSO and you can try them out and they lead to dcloud where you can reserve a pod with NSO already pre-installed up and running and you can go ahead and practice with this and understand if this is something that, that you need uh, I hope this answers your question WMAN83 um, Shell code. Can you uh, is asking? Can you add a pass for network engineer is programming knowledge on your blog? Uh, we'll see. Um, so a couple of things that uh, that are interesting in this area. The main the main problem is that um, well, I will write about this more on my blog post, but honestly right now I don't think there is a, a great resource on Python for network engineers out there um, so there are some which I will list but I don't think any of those can be named as like okay just go ahead do this and you will know enough about Python to apply for networking um, so but yeah uh, stay tuned for the blog post. Uh, I have a bunch of thoughts on this topic. Um, okay, I think we are done with most of the questions. Uh, let me know, guys, if you have any other questions during the stream. I'm always happy to to pause and to answer your your questions. Uh, okay, could you just there's another one. Could you discuss the differences uh, for the different Cisco automation products for enterprise networks? As far as I know, the Currently, you could do it with DNA Center and a Sun UCS director. Great question. Okay, so um, okay, let's let's do that. Uh, let's take DNA Center and an SO, mainly because I barely know anything about UCS director, though I suspect it's our data center product that helps automate. Uh, UCS servers uh, but I am not 100% sure that said I know more about DNA Center which is our uh, flagship enterprise product right now and I know something about NSO so uh, DNA Center is our enterprise product NSO comes from service provider business unit group the main differences between those are actually quite significant. I don't think they overlap at all, at least from my perspective. The main focus of DNA Center in like couple of sentences is it's our enterprise controller, which can control any kind of uh, any kind of enterprise device, and. Um, orchestrated in one solution but also what it is doing it's focused more on what you want to achieve what is right now called intent-based networking so 
instead of dealing with individual configurations, you actually deal with with your intent. Like for example, oops, and I'm keep losing my left uh, left AirPod. So um, instead of dealing with individual configurations on the device, you actually have some kind of intent. For example, you have a group of users. Uh, you have one group of users, you have another group of users, and you would like to enable or restrict communication between those two groups. And in DNA Center, you would you would do that, and it will actually automatically provision necessary config uh, config to the devices. It, it's working. It's working in tandem with uh, ICE. There is a lot of um, a lot of um, use cases and benefits that you get you you get with if you have ice uh, you get mobility so you you have your user plug into any switch or wireless anywhere on the network and you get the same kind of policies anywhere you are um, you also have the piece what is called assurance so you can understand what is um, what is going on with your network basically uh, gain some insights about what is going on if there are some problems um, and so on so just to summarize uh, to uh, to summarize this this kind of brief uh, introduction to DNA Center the idea there is that there are some kind of assumptions made for you uh, so that you don't have to deal with individual configurations uh, and some kind of decisions are also made for you so that you are actually focused on your uh, on more more high level stuff like what are your sites what are the devices that you have in your site what are the role of these devices how users should communicate with each other and so on so this is the idea behind DNA Center compared to NSO NSO is pure network configuration ne network configuration state management tool so in NSO you actually deal with your config in a little bit abstracted way we will discuss it in just a moment uh, but you still deal with IP addresses and BGP policies and usernames and well any kind of configs that you usually do on the devices you actually deal with that is that kind of primitive so it's much more low level and there you also with this you get some kind of granularity of what exactly you would like to configure and what you would like to achieve so the main focus on of NSO would be to have some kind of uh, do-it-yourself automation and it's somewhere it's it's uh, from my perspective it's uh, in the same domain where Ansible is partially. We also discuss in the Soviet versus Ansible today as well. Um, and yeah, but you have to manage the individual individual um, network configurations on the devices. Um, okay, so there's comment, but for and so you also need to know, for example, device roles to use the right templates. Correct. Uh, you do that said you you still dealing with the configuration templates with DNA center you are actually trying to put what exactly you want to achieve and it will push a bunch of different network configuration for you if that makes any sense um, I could I could I think show it live, but honestly, I don't want to turn this uh, stream into uh, from learning Cisco and so to oh let's have let's have a, uh, let's have verse DNA Center versus NSO. Uh, okay, let me know, guys, if you have any other questions. Um, Okay, and I will I will start just doing what we were supposed to be doing today. So I do have my uh, topology in Genia 3. I have a bunch of switches here in the middle. 
I have a bunch of routers here as well. I'm not 100% sure you will be able to get to the point where NSO will manage this network today because uh, I plan to have at least a couple of streams about NSO in the future. This is only the first one, so... Uh, so, uh, most likely we will get through some examples, through some getting started to make sure it's working, all that stuff, and an actual application to the, like, our our lab will be in some future streams. Um, for example, in similar way, like we had with Ansible, at least three or four streams in, in a row. So uh, there's another question. So NSO is more of abstraction layer to provide a structure interface for different devices like Napalm. Yes, you're absolutely correct. Um, it's the, in, the idea behind NSO is very similar to the idea behind Napalm to have uh, to have a structured in, uh, structured API basically to manage network configuration. Uh, however, they do approach this problem very differently. So uh, Napalm compared to NSO, and actually I had a stream about Napalm. I think three streams ago. And uh, well, if you remember, my sentiment wasn't extremely high about this after I, I got some hands on. Um, what, what basically Napalm is trying to do is that you have, you have your, uh, your, let's say functions or modules uh, where you could do something in vendor independent way. So let's say you, you get ARP table, this is your function, and uh, you will get results regardless of the vendor. So, and the way they achieve this is, well, you, they basically write in sub-modules for every different vendor for this function, where they go ahead and parse parse config, uh, sorry, excuse me, uh, they parse CLI output, or they do some kind of API call to the vendor get the data and convert it to vendor independent uh, structure. So this is how Napalm approaches this. And there was, I think, a lot of hopes that everyone, you know, is going to be extending that. But honestly, I don't see a lot of people, other people other than maintainers to actually doing a lot of work on Napalm. Uh, so uh, for example, during the last stream, we had a situation where, okay, I would like to pull up ARP table. You can do that in vendor in independent way, but then, oh, I also have a VRF, so I would like to pull up ARP table for the VRF, and this functionality does not exist. So if you'd like to continue using Napalm, you should go ahead and basically write additional modules for that. And I just don't see people doing that a lot in the industry right now. So the second the second we need something that that falls outside of what was written already, you are in a lot of trouble because you either need to extend Napalm at this point or you have to fall back to some other tool uh, and then use any kind of benefit you have from Napalm. And um, it's only the only use case that I really remembered and I really liked was some kind of operational data, uh, like like operation. Sorry, not operational data, but operational commands like ping or trace route. So you do those functions and you get structured structured uh, reply from different vendors about ping responses or trace routes, hops, whatever it is. Um, that was I think kind of neat from my perspective for doing some kind of configuration or doing some kind of uh, pull about um, information. I don't, I don't see it as a go-to tool for network automation, honestly. So which direction, uh, so which direction beginner should take na Napalm or NSO? Okay, another great question. Thank you guys very much for, for keeping this Questions coming. I think um, I think those all of those are very important ones. 
Uh, we do have so many tools right now in the industry that you really don't know where you should start. Uh, so from my perspective, uh, beginners should not start learning either of those tools. From my perspective, again, and this is just my personal opinion, Napalm, you will not solve a lot of pro business problems with Napalm. You could solve a lot of business problems with NSO, but there is also some learning curve and you'll start seeing this today. So honestly, as a beginner, I would actually start with Ansible. Uh, even though I don't think Ansible is also the right tool to do network automation. Um, and yes, there is another comment. I think Napalm is pretty easy to start and so is not the cheapest product. I have not found it on GPL so far. You are correct. Now, Napalm is also quite easy to start with, but yeah, it's just Yes, you will learn the tool, but what kind of benefit you will get by learning the tool? Honestly, I think uh, doing some kind of Ansible work will give you more benefit. You can do more with just Ansible uh, compared to Napalm. That said, you can use Napalm with Ansible, with uh, Napalm Ansible modules, and those actually look, uh, look interesting and useful, at least some of them. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, we, are, we are getting to an NSO part, but since I started mentioning Ansible, um, I think I will give you some more details why I think that Ansible is not the right tool for doing network automation. Um, so let me pull up my, my text editor, you will, you will see in a moment. And I usually give this example to anyone who is saying that Ansible is a great tool for doing network configuration management. Um, so, yeah, let's let let's get started. So let let's do this. For example, you have uh, on your network device currently you have username, uh, username. Let's say Alex, and you have username. Uh, username n configured I and what so currently uh, what you would like to have so and you would like to end up with uh, usernames let's say n and username charlie okay and this example can be extended to any other use case, like uh, remember how many uh, stale static routes you have on the device which was running for five years or something. So while I was working in tech, I saw so many, so many stale configurations that I couldn't even imagine. So you like log into the device and you see a bunch of static routes that have absolutely no sense or some kind of IPsec tunnels that were not operational for a couple of years or so. So actually stale configuration is quite significant problem. So, but for this example, let's just take this small use case. Okay, so you have these two usernames configured and you would like to end up with these two. Okay. Now imagine you don't have a module for your uh, for your vendor in Ansible to manage usernames. Okay, so what you will end up doing most likely you will end up writing a Jinja template where you would have something like uh, I don't know username username or maybe. Let's do this. You will have like some some kind of for loop for user in uh, users. You will have user dot username and like password uh, username dot password. So you will end end up with something like this. Okay. And you will also need to replicate this for different, 
for different vendors. So you either save different templates for different vendors or you have here an if statement. No, probably you'll have just different folders for different vendors with this template, something like this. This looks good. The only problem with this, if you apply this with Ansible, you will do config merge. So you will have, you will, well, basically this is your Jinja template, then you have your YAML file, let's say switch1.yaml, or no, let's do this, uh, a core group YAML, we have users, uh, users, we have username, and password uh, admin and then you have username uh, charlie password admin you have also in declarative way uh, the variable somewhere in yaml file okay so then you apply this template based on these variables uh hello jumpy rabbit nice to see you man um, so um, you will have this YAML file with variables, you have the Jinja template, you apply this with your uh, generic vendor module and what you will end up is you will end up with config merge. So you will end up with usernames Alex, Ian and Charlie. Uh, the main reason why is that previously you had username Alex already configured but uh, you didn't do anything about this, okay? So the way to solve it with Ansible is that you need to have a module which manages usernames and passwords for your vendor in Ansible. So I think right now it exists. I think it was called config AAA or something. I don't remember. And what this module is actually doing, it's going to the device, getting show run specific section. So like show run section username, seeing what are the current usernames, what are the usernames you would like to configure, and applying no no commands and and basically username commands and no username commands to end up with your users. This is all good, however, the only problem with this, once you actually start applying this to business problems, like you want to configure uh, interface interface on switch, right? And what are the usual configs that you have? You have your uh, trunk access with VLANs. You have some spanning tree stuff. You have dot one X. Potentially you have QS. Uh, what else? maybe some other stuff, okay? So you need to configure a bunch of this stuff. You go ahead to Ansible modules and you look what is available. And you will see like uh, this stuff, for example, is available, but maybe you can't disable DTP using Ansible, okay? Spanning tree, maybe one or two things are available, okay, and so on. So, uh, so <laughs> the problem is this: is that if you actually start applying this to what you have to achieve, you will end up with a scenario where your module doesn't cover the functionality that you need, and what you will end up doing you will end up either writing your Ansible modules, which is actually not, it's not fun, let's put it that way. I've been there, done that. Um, so you will need, yeah, you will need to either write your modules that, that implement your particular config, uh, or you will end up fall, doing fallback to the Jinja template and this is what most people actually fall back to, and then, and then that's pretty much it, right? If you fall back here, you will end up with config merge. So you will. So what this what this really means? What, what is my takeaway here? 
Ansible can't really manage network configuration state. Okay, this is my takeaway from all of this 15 minute speech is that yes, you can push some kind of config using Ansible, but no, you can't really guarantee network configuration state. Okay, so you can't, you don't really know what you will end up, uh, what your config will be as a result on the device. Will it contain only necessary sections or it will contain some kind of mix of what was there before and what is new, okay? So this is my main problem with Ansible. This is why I think it's not just the right tool for doing network automation. Um, another thing is actually quite interesting. Uh, just yesterday, uh, well, I think like one week or one month ago, there was Red Hat Summit. Um, there was Red Hat Summit and there were a bunch of Ansible sessions there. And I was listening to one of the sessions called, let me actually find it on Google. Um, managing 15,000 network devices with Ansible. I think this is, this is what it was called. Yeah, this one. Managing 15,000 network devices with Ansible. Um, so, and I was listening to this presentation and I just realized that it's even worse than I expected. I'm sorry for, uh, for being, for, you know, critiquing Ansible, even though everyone really likes Ansible. So, Basically, with this kind of scale, um, they their playbooks to configure something like SNMP community strings on devices were taking uh, three three hour forty minutes or something. Uh, and I, I was speechless, honestly. Uh, the main problem is doing the scale with Ansible is the way Ansible works, it's using forks. So uh, it's basically using multiple processes. By default, it spawns five. And basically you have five different Python interpreters running as a processes on the device, uh, on the, your, your control host. And then obviously you can change this number. The main problem is that multiprocessing uh, is quite expensive. The overhead of multiprocessing with Python is extremely expensive. Having and their solution to this problem was add more cores to their machines to be able to run more processes at the same time. But if you think about this, if you really think about this, um, doing any kind of network configuration change is not CPU intensive task. So honestly, there is almost no computational expense on doing any kind of network configuration change. The so main bottleneck of this, if this um, interaction is actually I/O input output, and having more processes to solve I/O bound problems is actually not a great idea. I wanted to say stupid, but let's just have it not a great idea you don't really gain a lot with this. That's my bottom line. How you usually solve it with Python, and remember Ansible is written in Python, usually solve this problem in Python by spawning threads, or you are using technique called async IO to do, uh, to do asynchronous uh, coroutines where you submit tasks and you yield control back to your, uh, to your thread so that you can do something else while you are waiting for a response from the network. So after listening to that presentation, I was actually thinking if I ever will have this kind of scale requirements, instead of using Ansible, most likely I will go back to just writing Python scripts with using async.io and multi-threading. Multi and unfortunately I don't have this kind of environment to test 
but I I suspect that it will really take 10 minutes instead of 3 hours, 40 minutes to configure SNMP everywhere. Um, so this is, again, just my personal opinion on this. If that, yeah, I mean, if you will start scaling on a big number of network devices, you will actually end up in a lot of trouble with Ansible. Or, I mean, it will be just low. Um, okay, so this is my, my reasons why I don't like Ansible. All of that said, I am using Ansible in some of my projects. So, a um, couple of streams before, uh, well, I think like five streams before, I was doing a lab management system, and this is a part. The part that was covered on the stream is actually part of my uh, current pro work project. So we actually using Ansible there. Um, that said. Um, I my idea is that to migrate from 100% Ansible to 20% Ansible and 80% NSO. This is actually the main reason why I'm I am learning this uh, this product. I mean NSO today, and I'm actually going to spend almost all the next week at work learning the NSO to make sure I can I can do this migration. Um, okay, so there are a couple of comments that are actually quite interesting as well. Yes, it's true, you, you need a single source of truth and you ideally push out complete configure parts of them and override the local stuff. So yes, uh, you are correct. So actually for this project that I was just talking about, because it was a lab environment, what we were doing, uh, how we were approaching this, we were doing configure replace to minimal config. So we were falling back to minimal config, which contains SSH access, net conf configure, rest conf configured. So you an IP address configured on management interface. So you just have an access via control system to the device. And after doing that, uh, we were actually pushing the new config that we were generating using templates in Ansible. So this is how it, it is done right now. Um, we, well, this works, but we just don't want to do that. We actually want to, to do, um, network configuration change and falling back to new config differently without any kind of fallback. We can do configure replace, uh, because then we are relying on having the file locally, which contains, uh, which contains uh, this minimal config and sometimes we can guarantee that because students can mess up with devices. Um, okay, another question. Did you look at nor near yet before? Uh, yes, I did. I didn't do any hands on. Uh, my, my first, my first, um, my first thought about the project and I also discussed this on some streams before uh, when it was called Brigade is that they are reinventing Ansible. After seeing this presentation that I'm showing you right now, if managing 15,000 network devices with Ansible, I'm actually thinking that it's actually a good idea. Um, that said, there is another tool that is doing very, very similar thing and it's very mature and it's called Fabric, Python Fabric, uh, this one, and they just recently released version 2.0 and 2.1, which supports Python 3. So the idea here is also very similar to Brigade. I do not know like exact details, like because I didn't touch, I didn't do any hands-on with them. Uh, this one is usually used for provisioning servers. I'm not sure if you can do network devices as well. Um, but basically it's just writing Ansible-like code in just pure Python. And the idea here is similar to a non uh, But this tool is on the market for, for quite a long time, for years. Uh, so probably I will actually end up checking fa fabric and or near maybe actually um, maybe actually on the stream at some point. So I'm really thinking that for the 
For the scale, you need something like a sync IO and threads, and this is where Ansible will not solve any kind of problem for you. Uh, okay. In what setup do you use Ansible NSO, Ansible calling to NSO via NSO module, or Ansible reaching out to, NSO, to Ansible for some tasks or next to each other? Wow, you guys are rocking today with all of your great questions. Um, I honestly can't remember any other stream where, where participants were so active with their questions and all of the questions were on point. Um, so, great question. Uh, so, uh, my personal feeling, which is not proven yet, is I think that I will let NSO manage network configuration devices, uh, but I'm going to call NSO using Ansible. The main reason why is that um, it kind of boils down to architecture of NSO as well. Uh, there is one big thing that I really like, uh, that I really like about Ansible. And this is it, uh, the fact that all of your data is stored in text files, in YAML files as variables which you can commit to git and have proper diff and proper uh, proper commit history and versioning this is my main reasoning why i think well why i like ansible uh, and you can integrate easily with some kind of uh, ci cd tools where you do some kind of config uh, change in the text file you push it to the git um, then you run your test automation, um, uh, sorry, test routines to make sure the change is actually doing correct thing. Um, and then you can either push this to prod or you can roll back to previous version. Uh, NSO stores the, and this also has a, a notion of commits, but it stores it in local database. So you can't really do git on that easily even though you do have versioning but you at least from what i understood you can't really just go ahead and integrate git easily so what i'm thinking that my project with lab uh, lab um, management system i'm going to from ansible i'm going to call in a saw and it's going to manage my network devices and from Ansible I'm going to call directly some other stuff we have virtual machines uh, necessary for the lab we have uh, we have uh, some services like DHCP uh, DHCP, DNS, uh, TFTPD so we also create config files for that using Ansible um, so I do think it's going to be like this uh, in the future, but all of the network devices management is going to be done through NSO as an intermediary. Okay, um, so I have seen the slides for NSO from Clues and there are also examples for calling NSO from Ansible as well as calling Ansible from NSO. Yeah, so you can do vice versa. I am leaning towards calling NSO from Ansible and having Ansible as a single, single entry point. And then in the future, I will have some kind of front end which is calling Ansible on the back end. Uh, thanks, thanks actually for the, for the session ID. Let me actually, I will go ahead and save it. Just give me a second guys. So put it somewhere in my resources to make sure I actually have all these references after, after we end the stream. The CDP is for separate binary files which are not really manageable by Git, yes. At least where they get stored as it runs in inventory. Yeah, this was my understanding as well. Okay, awesome. Guys, thank you very much for your questions. Uh, okay, let's actually start discussing briefly 
what's so different about NSO compared to all other tools that are out there for network configuration management, like Ansible, Salt, blah, 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 Nornir, all of these tools, okay? Because I do believe NSO is doing something very different to all of these tools that are out there. So, uh, Just another question, doesn't help to use Ansible in a sync IO module? I don't think you can. Well, I haven't seen that you can that you could call a sync IO from Ansible. If you could, maybe it's something worth exploring, but I haven't tried. Probably you can't. Uh, to actually use a sync IO with Ansible, all of your Ans Ansible core code will probably need to be adapted for a sync. Uh, so you could use NetMiko, so I think uh, IO should also work. I disagree. When whenever you use a sync IO, all of your structure of of program is different. It requires complete rewrite. You can't just plug, replace NetMiko with a sync IO. Uh, just there, all of your code should be should be a sync now, and I don't really think Ansible will, be a, will ever support this because from my understanding right now you will need complete rewrite of Ansible core to be able to support this. Okay, so I just discussed like thirty minutes ago. I discussed how with Ansible you would do this kind of change you would change usernames and diff different approaches there and uh what you will what you will end up with and so on so let's start discussing nso so what nso does differently so the idea behind nso is is uh the following First, in NSO, you have what is called database, uh, and I think the proper name is uh, CDB, or maybe it's something different. I don't really recall all, all of these terms. Uh, I will just try to explain to you my own understanding of the tool, and I could also be wrong in some 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 places. So you have you have your database uh, where you store store all of all of the network configuration changes, all of the changes. <laughs> yeah, there is some, some, some great, great comment in the chat. Um, okay, so you store all of your changes as commits, basically. So whenever you do any kind of change, and I still haven't covered how you actually do change, but whenever you do any kind of change and you commit this to database, and this is basically a checkpoint in your database, okay? So any kind of change is stored there in database as a checkpoint. So you have this big list uh, in database of these points where you can actually go back, okay? There is another thing called NAT, and this is, I think, network element driver or something like this. I don't recall how how it's, how it's uh, uh, deciphered. And NAT is usually provided as a package, as a as a, a package package for specific. Uh, network operating system, let's put it that way. For example, package, a net package for iOS, net package for ASA, net package for, for uh, Junos. Okay? What this is doing is it, it's doing the following for the all devices that do not support netconf. It basically does the following. It takes 
it takes the running config let's, let's just not have running let's just have config okay so in is it will be something like shora and converts this to abstract yank model okay so instead of let's say you have username uh, and password Cisco and it will convert this to some kind of yank model um, which they I think they call them net models where you have something like um, like username and and password Cisco something like this okay so this abstract yank model technically is similar between all different vendors so it's abstraction on top of the different vendor implementations so you have your basically one one abstract yank model which um, which sits on top of all these different network operating systems okay so on this step as well what they also do okay so there is also some kind of um, addition here it also does similar thing for devices with netconf uh, as you have a net even if you have a net congress oh great I, I actually didn't know that thanks yeah it's it's great to have actually a person on the stream who actually did some NSO work compare uh, compared to me who who was shown only some kind of demos and explain the stuff but I didn't do any kind of hands-on until today okay so besides converting the config to the abstract yank model and remember yank model is used wisely in for like netconf uh, um, and this is basically a structured way to represent uh, configuration and operational data on the device um, so besides doing this translation it also knows how what config to apply for any yank model change okay for example this is what you have you have username n and password cisco and your new state that you are going to have is going to be a uh, username and password cisco123 this kind of package also knows that in order for get to get from this state to this state what you have to do is you have to apply no username n username n password cisco123 okay for example if you would like to get from username n and uh, username alex password cisco to username and um, username charlie you need to do the following you need to do no username alex and username charlie password cisco123 so basically for any single part in show run well actually vice versa for any kind of a change in the yank model they have appropriate div commands so either a plus command like this or no command if we are talking about cisco is if it's some kind of different device like juniper uh, then it will be appropriate config changes there so basically this package is responsible for two-way conversion between the actual config 
this which can be vendor specific and which usually is to this abstract Yang model uh, with what we are going to operate. Okay. So this is the first, first like main thing. So what you end up doing when you are actually want to do any kind of change, you are going to talk to an SO control station and say, okay, I would like to end up in the state this. Okay. What NSO is going to do, it will going to go on device, check what is currently there, convert to abstract Yang model, calculate diff between the uh, current thing, current Yang model and desired yank model state convert div to actual um, vendor specific commands or operations okay so this could be uh, login via ssh uh, do some CLI commands uh, and or n no equivalent of commands um, or or doing netconf to the device if it supports netconf something like this if this makes sense okay so let's let's walk through this again. You as a network operator, somehow you communicate with NSO and you say, I would like to end up with usernames Anne and Charlie. NSO is going on the specific device and check, checking what is there, converts it to abstract Yank model, converts this abstract Yank model representation uh, sorry, compare this current young model representation with what you want to have, calculates diff, what is supposed to be added, what is supposed to be uh, removed. And then it goes ahead and, and applies this kind of operations on the device. Now, because any kind of change that you are doing is saved locally in the database in an SO, you also have this big history of what was done there so you can always go go ahead to any kind of moment because it's stored in this abstract mo young model state you go ahead there it goes to the device compares what is there with what you want to have calculates diff and applies necessary operations this is the idea behind netconf okay so netconf from the from ground up was designed to actually manage network configuration state there are some consequences of any kind of tools that would like to do network configuration state the main thing is that you shouldn't really be touching the device in any other way you shouldn't touch it anymore from any other interface rather than in a saw okay uh, you can, but then you end up in what is called like inconsistency state or unsync state. And then if you do that, you either need to resync the current state back from the device or uh, rewrite anything that is there with your intent. Okay. So this is in nutshell what is an SO. Now, what are different ways to interact with NSO? There are three main ways. One is CLI. This is what we are going to do today, mo mostly. We will. So actually NSO has their vendor independent CLI. And I think the main reason why it is there is to actually 
make it easier for network engineers to use this. We'll see in very briefly that you would do something like, like on IS device you do show run, yeah? In NSO you would do show run devices, device, and name, name of your device, something like this. You have IS style CLI, or they actually have alternative style, which is Juniper, Juniper style CLI as well. So if you are really used to Juniper style, you can switch it and you'll have this Juniper style uh, CLI there. Okay, so this is one way. Second way, you have GUI. Um, you have GUI where you, well, where you can actually do this kind of changes. I, I am not a fan of GUI, but that may be just me. Uh, third way is API. So anything that you can do in an SO, you can do the same kind of thing with API. And this is where this kind of in different integrations like with Ansible comes into play. So for example, Ansible will push just REST request to NSO uh, to specific endpoints uh, and NSO will, uh, will actually accept that and do, do its magic. Okay, so from my perspective, the main, well, the most interesting uh, interface would be an actual API and CLI for do some kind of uh, check. There are a couple of more uh, comments that I would like to actually address. Uh, that sounds really great. Looking forward to see it in action. Hopefully there are some great debugs to see what is what it is doing and even have possibility to do dry runs. Uh, so I have no clue <laughs> if there are some. I hope so, but I don't know. Uh, that's the main issue with these systems and so it's wonderful if you have greenfield deployments get really fishy with brownfield brown fast if you didn't plan for it. Uh, yes, there is some work that is being done there and I was shown the interesting demo where, where you have your network regardless of how it is configured. Uh, and there is, let me actually pull it up. I was shown this demo like, I think like one month ago and I was actually really impressed. Um, let's see, uh, I think GitHub, Kevin Corbin, this guy. Uh, I really hope he didn't change, change it. Let's go spark bot. I think this one, either this one or this one. Sorry guys, I don't remember 100%. Um, so we will not spend too much time on this, but the idea here is the following. You have your network, you spin up an SO and you have Ansible. You run the playbook, it goes ahead and it's doing sync operation from the, uh, from the, uh, from the devices to an SO database. So an SO right now has the current state of the network. And then also populating local variables, uh, local variables in this declarative state, declarative way, which coincides with an SO model. So you actually run this, and you end up with with a file with all of the variables that are currently configured on the device. So then you can go ahead and let's say change some kind of parameter there in Ansible, push it, and then it will go to NSO and push this change. Um, okay, 
Serran so nice debug option and also traces for every Southbound interface to the devices. Uh, okay, I can comment on that. GUI is not so great. Stick to CLI. Uh, I, well, I guess so. Every okay. The problem is in the sub field is that you somehow have to reconfigure the local database state without pushing to the network to get in sync again. If you want to keep the config on call, you did it in a night shift, which is complicated and expensive. Yes, I agree with you, this is a problem and basically you have to change the way how you do network configuration changes. I mean, this is really the main reason why you would want to, in to implement an SO in the first place. So, I mean, yes, this is a mindset this is a mindset change that you can't just, you know, like one day say, hey everyone, we have an SO now and this is how you are supposed to do your thing, right? Obviously you need to train, train your stuff to use it, you need to have some plan, as you said. Um, so, yeah, obviously, well, tell me, tell me this, tell me any other situation where you want to implement a new technology in the brownfield which was not associated with any kind of migration plan or risk assessment and all this stuff and uh, some kind of additional training like whenever i think about anything right i don't know you want to implement this d1 in your network you can't just, you know, go ahead and, you know, just, just do it, right? There is always should be some kind of, some kind of migration path. Um, yeah, I'm, you know, yeah, we, we are just discussing. It's not like, you know, I'm uh, trying to argue or anything. Um, thank you very much for, for your input though. Oh, um, there is another thing that is very different in NSO, which is not present right now, really in Ansible. And I, I really need to mention it because it's I think it's important. It's called service or service service package. And the, the idea behind service is actually what it sounds like is. Well, think about this uh, typical a typical example is something like L3 VPN, right? So whenever you configure L3 VPN, you have to touch at least like four devices or so. Okay, so you need to configure PE uh, where, well, depends if you have access to C or not, right? So if you have, if you are controlling C, then you need to do changes on C device, you need to configure VRFs on PE, you need to configure, uh, you need to configure VPN before, um, you need to, well, Depends if it's already there or not. Potentially, uh, well, at least you will need to configure new VRFs with RDs and RTs. You need to configure whatever you want to redistribute on the on the P. Uh, you need to have some kind of configuration on C, and then it's very similar stuff on another end of the of the VPN, right? Potentially, you may also need to enable uh, MPLS on some new links to the core if it's not enabled there, whatever that is, right? In general, you will have to touch at least two devices, usually four, and sometimes even more to provision an LTE VPN. Uh, what you are really doing is that you are provisioning LTE VPN for some new customer or some new subnets or whatever that is, right? So in the NSO, you can create your own Yank model, which will describe the service, okay? And what it really is, is just a bunch of variables, like a service will be customer name or VRF name, right? Uh, maybe it will be IP, some IP addresses. I don't know. Mm, uh, it will be, uh, oops, again, I'm losing my left airport. Uh, it, it may be routes uh, that are going to be sent, right? Something like this. So you can create this kind of Yank model in an SO as a package. 
and then you will basically provision the service by filling up these variables okay so you say oh i have a new customer name this and some kind of ip address is this and we are going to send routes this okay and using your service definition that you described in like python or something it is going to be converted to uh, to the actual changes to yank models on the different devices that that needs to be changed okay this is concept is very important um you we use it all the time really like you provision new user right on the network or new application uh and like i don't know new, new application what it really is like switch ports vlans um some kind of firewall rules blah 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 all of this stuff right so you can actually define the service with all bunch of these variables and then your service package will translate this to abstract model of the actual config on different devices and then you could all again use GUI for example to provision the service or you can use API uh, provide this kind of variables and you will get your service provisioned for example, in my lab management system, I had a service which was basically, it's called, I think I call it matrix. Basically where I had two distant devices that are supposed to be appeared uh, as directly connected through infrastructure. And to do that, I was actually creating dot one q tunnel in my infrastructure. Uh, sorry, not dot one q tunnel, q and q tunnel is appropriate VLANs and blah 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 so I could actually define this as a service where okay my intent is to connect this and this device and then the service is going to figure out what exact config changes is supposed to be applied on different devices this is a concept of service uh, okay so there are two RFC links uh, and let me actually copy them as well and pull it them up and I will also save them to my to my notes because this is I really just started this journey so so my next week will be buried in uh, doing a lot of a lot of this stuff so that will actually save this to my one note just give me a second guys and I do realize that we haven't done any kind of hands-on yet. But I think it's important because we have all these different discussions. Before actually, I, I, I tend to use this approach anytime I do any kind of coding, for example. I never just jump into coding. I'm trying to understand what problem I'm trying to solve why and why I'm solving it the way I think I am supposed to solve, to solve this. So after a lot of discussions with my colleagues um, and people who actually know NSO quite well, I was really convinced that I really need it for at least my project. So, um, so right now we spent almost an hour talking about all this different stuff, but I think it's really important to just go ahead. Oh, here is this new shiny tool. Uh, let's just use it to actually start building understanding why is this tool why not some other tool you know so i think this this uh this is valuable will you be using the cloud for hands-on there are great labs it if other users want to try hands-on themselves as well i have a dcloud session scheduled but i'm not sure I'm, i scheduled the right one so actually i'm not planning to use the cloud for this lab only i will use it as a backup if everything fails probably you have access to the project anyway um yeah i i have so here is what what i have so let's actually start going into this oops and i lost my connection to server so i have this gns3 server uh where i run a bunch my small network and the server is called emerald it's right here uh and I have folder called NSO. 
and here before the stream like this morning I was I was actually you know trying to make sure that I am prepared for the stream so I downloaded the the uh, files necessary for the uh, I downloaded the necessary files that uh, I need to run NSO so the main file is this this is an actual package uh, for installation of NSO um, and I also downloaded the docs and a couple of um, couple of um, basically net packages. So this one is for ASA, this one is for IS, and this one is for Junos. I think I will be mostly using this one today, but you know I just downloaded them just in case. I downloaded them using um, Cisco account, so. Unfortunately, if you don't have a license, I don't think you can just go ahead and download it. Um, have seen there are a lot of dcloud labs. Any recommendations which one to use to starting? So, I had the same problem today. I don't know. I found one which is... There, there was one which were released in May this year. Uh, let me see if I can pull this up. Okay. Give me a second, guys. I will log in to my Cisco account here. Okay, I think this is uh, the one that is uh, the, m the most updated one. This is going to show modeling 101 lab scenarios 1.6, but I'm not 100% sure. Because, yeah, I was talking to, to one guy and he was doing that and he told me like, this is coming and we were talking about, in, uh, about this in April. And this lab seems to be the most recent one, so I guess this is correct one. Uh, so to find it, so I, I logged in into, in this case, it's London data center of dcloud. And you go to catalog and then you search for this. And this was created on, published on 23rd of May. So I guess this is the lab that he was talking about. But I, I can't really comment on that. Uh, okay. So yeah, I have a session here, but I'm not sure I want to use it because I really, I really want to, uh, to, to get it up and running for my environment. Um, okay. So how to get started if you, if you have all that. So, uh, I figure out that. Hold on. Let me cover some other things that you may find relevant. So one of them is developer Cisco com site and so. Uh, so um, this is like the main portal for NSO now. So on here you have a link to dcloud. The, there is also an SO developer hub, which is the main community where all of the resources are published. And again, I have to log in. Okay, hold on, guys. From my perspective, on this community portal, it's really hard to find what you're looking for. Um, but this seems to be the only place where all of the all of the stuff is published. Yeah. Yeah, I also heard about NSO Developer Days in Stockholm. I was so, I really wanted to join. It's a problem that I returned from Orlando this Thursday. So, and it was from like Tuesday to Thursday. I really wanted to, to come there, but it just didn't work out with my schedule. They don't have a session posted yet. I just, I was, I was searching for them today 
So there is this recent blog post, they say they are not posted yet, expect them in upcoming weeks. Um, yeah, so yeah, I'm also really looking forward to, to this new content. I'm really excited to see what, what they come up with. So this is the main portal probably you would want to know about NSO, uh, about NSO. All of the resources are here. And also the develop uh, the devnet uh, side as well so also on devnet there are a bunch of labs uh, that you can you can walk through so you go to nso learning labs and they have a bunch of lab uh, lab content for nso to learn it so they even actually cover all of the architecture and all of that stuff that I was trying to explain on the stream uh, without full understanding of the product, but you could find a lot of details here um, in this learning labs. Let me let me see what, what is the link, that, the Twitter link that was sent. So developer, wow. That's pretty cool. Now I really regret that I didn't didn't go. <laughs> okay. So, Devnet Devnet portal for NSO, NSO community, NSO developer hub. Yeah. And also they have docs that are usually distributed. At least I found them only on the page where you download NSO on um, download portal. I do not know if you can access all of these docs without uh, without an, an access to the product itself. I suspect you can't. Uh, let's actually see NSO book Cisco. I don't know. I'm sorry guys, I don't know that, but together where I downloaded the file on software.cisco.com, I, there was a file called the doc.jz uh, and this contains all of the docs. Yeah, that's actually pretty unfortunate. Okay, so after I extracted those, uh, there is a web page, oops. Okay, let me close this one. Uh, close this two. I had it open just a second. Oh, here. So this is a file that I opened. Let me make it bigger. And here is all of the docs that, that they provide. So I started with an SO installation guide and uh, yeah, they, there is a choice local versus system install since this is for development. I used a local install uh, So there are and I think I will need to make this page larger for every single thing so the main uh, Honestly the actual installation process was extremely straightforward uh, I spent more time installing uh, Java JDK 7 or higher on Ubuntu rather than ex installing NSO. So yeah, so this requirement you have to have Java installed and then you go, why default small, a font is so small? So basically you have this file installer.bin, you, you invoke it with, with SH, you do this and you also need to do the source so that your environmental variables are populated. So, and it took me like, this process took me really a minute. So, if I do print env, no, let me do this, um, cd ncs47, uh, okay. cs47, and there is this file which you are supposed to source so that your um, 
your couple of your environmental variables are populated so that was pretty much it now I think I also did this where it creates database state files logs and other files however in this particular case as far as I remember for examples it's not needed let me actually do this uh, let me also I will while I will be going through this I'm also going to make some notes for myself uh, We are not going to run uh, NSO right now, so you usually invoke it with just NS NCS, but we are not going to do that right now. We are going to go through their examples and probably this will be like the main focus of today's stream. And maybe if you will have some time, we'll try adding our current devices there as well, but I'm not so confident we'll get there. Okay, so... Um, so with this NCS setup, you create basically directory structure and database, create directory structure and database. And then you run just uh, in this folder, you just run NCS. Okay, so yeah, that's pretty much it. It wasn't so painful as I thought it would be. Okay, let's go back to main page and uh, I have to find this. I think it's manual pages. No, it's other information. Uh, no, actually it's not. Yeah, I have to go back to books. And then I'm going to go to getting started guide. Uh, okay. Okay. I. I will. I will get mad if I will need to add. Uh, I will need to zoom in every single on every single page. Let me try to find if I can set default. Firefox set default zoom. Let's see if this can be done. Okay. Let's do this. I'm not so sure anymore if this value says minus 1.0 I think I'm going to regret this This seems to work. Uh, yeah, okay, I, at least I can read this. Okay, okay so. Uh, okay. So, and so over you, main features. No, 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 no. We don't need that. Okay, there are some some beautiful images with their architecture. Okay, so they have device model and service model. We briefly talk about those. Um, they have drivers to actually connect to devices. Uh, this tool, I guess, they just interact with service model and dev device model. Okay. And so uses dedicated built-in storage code configuration database CDB for all config data. 
uh, it keeps this data in sync with real network device configuration audit uh, okay no <laughs> just take me to examples I want to have examples okay and so basics getting started okay let's actually go here so there's another thing that is shipped together with uh, NSO and it's called uh, NetSIM. So NetSIM is basically a way to create emulated devices or simulate. I always mix simulator versus emulator. So basically NetSIM creates virtual device, but don't think about it as like CSRV or IOL or uh, virtual IOS. No, it actually creates like just, just completely virtual device. And the only thing it really has, it has a config and it has uh, well, and it can interact with the NSO basically. So instead of spinning up your actual virtual devices or physical devices, you can go ahead and spin up this, uh, I don't know how to name them, emulate devices, let's put it this way. So they just like, kind of like a shell, well, yeah, something, completely virtual but you you can't do so you can't use them to actually forward traffic let's put it this way uh, so in examples they usually use that they use net sim okay so we will go ahead and start with that so purpose of this section is get started with NSO yay this is exactly what I need use NSO network simulator to simulate 3is yeah yeah, there, there is very valid comment in the chat. It's basically CLI simulation that saves config state, no routing daemon, no protocol daemons, yeah. So it's basically like, yeah, just a thing that can emulate CLI. Uh, so which is very nice because, you, you know, it doesn't consume any resources really. Um, so you can spin up, I don't know, hundreds of those. Uh, easy. Okay, we will use NSO network simulator to simulate three Cisco S routers and NSO will talk Cisco CLI to those devices. You will use NSO CLI and web UI to perform tasks. Sometimes you will use a native Cisco device CLI to inspect configuration or do out of weight changes. Okay, so this is basically a topology for this example. You have your NSO station and you have just three devices, which are not real devices. Okay, woohoo, let's, let's go ahead and start this. Okay, so they say go to this folder. Um, ah. Let's do this. I want to be able to fit it on the screen. Okay, this should be. This should be okay. So, okay, they say go to examples, uh, getting started, uh, using NCS, and and one simulated device, simulated Cisco. Okay, most of the section follows the procedure in README file, so it's useful to have it open as well. Who needs a README file? <laughs> Um, let me see. Okay, they have some stuff here. Now I actually think that it's, it would be a good idea to have it pull up, pull up. Um, actually, you know what, guys? I'm actually will go ahead and and do that. Uh, so let me create an SO folder. in my network programmability lab and yeah so I will need to download it from here so so cdnso 
uh, let's also encadir uh, with let's do what let's do examples cd examples uh, and let's say we create one simulated sysqrs okay good uh, and we will log in there and then I am going to SFTP to my server. Okay. And I need to go to this big directory. Uh, okay. And I need let me also see what is in the readme net sim. Whatever. Uh, let's just get the readme file. So we will get readme. Okay. And I have my uh, my Visual Studio code. So And I saw read me. Yay. Okay, and is this markdown? I don't think it's markdown. Seems to be like a markdown. Okay. Okay, so we will also have this. And we will go ahead and continue with lab guide. Okay, so most of this section, okay, so they create three Cisco devices which will be named as C0, C0, C1, C2. Then the next thing they're doing, they're creating the these three devices. Okay, so using NetSim. So I'm also going to go ahead and save this to my notes. Uh, so something happened with music. I don't hear it anymore. I'll make it a, li a little bit louder. Okay, so, um, so this command is creating an sim devices in the network. Okay, so ncsd is a is an environmental variable that was populated. Uh, populated using that source, so it's basically pointing to this directory ncs47. Uh, let me go back to this directory. Okay, so we are creating these devices and then we start them. Okay, let me also do ncs net scene start. Okay. Sim network already exists in directory netsim. Please use netsim delete network. Okay. Yeah, it exists because before the stream I was uh, doing this example to at least make sure that I don't spend two hours on the stream installing everything like it usually happens. Okay, so I deleted the network. Let me start this again. Okay, so it's created. Now in NCS net sim start. This is strange. I think I know why though. Um I think because of this. Let me see. Because GNI3 uses port for like 5000. Oh yeah, it's right here. <laughs> nice collision. Uh, let's do this. Maybe. Let's do this. Because I don't really want to stop my topology because CSRs will take a long time. Um, okay, 
create network, some devices, prefix, units, and here. I don't see here an option so that I could. Um, I don't see here an option where I could change the. Here's something. Uh, Netconf SSH port, Netconf TCP port, ECLA. Use indicated number and upwards for. Uh, NSO change default NetSim console port. Okay, I guess I will have to actually stop those. Stop my GNS relap to continue. I don't know why it doesn't check that the, the port is already bound. <gasps> it was right here. If set config will use indicated port number and upwards for the local IPC port. Default is 5010. How I didn't notice this? Okay, so. Um, Just give me guys a moment. I want to make sure that I'm, I will need to change my environmental variables. I want to make sure that I don't show you my very private environmental variables on the on this machine. Just give me a moment. Okay, it's, it's actually all right. Okay. Uh. So you will need to delete this net sim delete Well this stuff was not because usually there in the file I store like a bunch of credentials and some API tokens and all that stuff so stuff that if it's leaked I will be in a lot of trouble so it's it's always good to double check. Um Okay, so I deleted this network. I have to save this path. I'm going to re login. So let's do print and wrap IPC. Okay, port is different. I go back to the directory. And they set. You have to create a network. Okay, let's do this again. Okay, create worked. Now it's NCS net sim start. Okay, now it started all right, but I already stopped my GNS3 topology, so let me start this as well. Okay, so I have my this virtual simulated CLI. Cisco CLI instances uh, started. So let's go ahead and continue with the lab guide. Okay, so now what you can do, you, they say, okay, now you, you can connect to these devices, okay, to their, to their conf T basically. So let's, uh, let me also put it uh, to my notes. Because I don't want to open up the lab guide again and I will have a real use case. Connect to consoles. So NC, NCS net sim CLI I. Okay, I can follow instructions but I have problem with doing though. So so I want to know what 
what that means. CLI C CLI I I don't know what it means This seems like CLI Cisco but then what is CLI I? I have no clue Did you talk about conf T on the stream before as in the tail F product and what you can do with this? I haven't talked about ConfD before uh, and the reason why is because I don't know anything about it so if you know something that would be that would be great to hear so we can all learn from each other okay I'm st I can't find what this CLI I this drives me nuts uh, but I will just at this point, I will just go ahead and do whatever they ask me to do. Uh, okay, so you say NCS, net, sim, CLI. No, I, I, I will just try this. Admin connected. Enable. Aha, uh -huh, okay, so this seems to be Juniper style CLI. So show. config let's say what let's say IP addresses IP IP yeah so this is Juniper style CLI um, is minus no I did it without it was just CLI okay and CLI C I guess what's the CLI I what is this Okay, this is seems to be. Okay, this is. I oh, this stands for iOS. Okay. They also have CLIC. What is CLIC? This seems to be the same. Okay, so it's CLI Cisco or CLI iOS. Okay then. Okay, so okay, let's just. Go ahead and do whatever they ask me. So CLI uh, I enable show run. Okay, and this is basically config that is there on the device using this conf D. Again, remember this is not an actual device, it's not even a virtual device, so it doesn't run any kind of routing protocol, it doesn't forward packets, it doesn't do anything, it just emulates CLI. Okay, this shows the device has some initial configs. Woohoo, good. Okay, so the previous step started to simulate a Cisco device. It is now time to start NSO. First action is to prepare directories needed for NSO and populate NSO with information about simulated devices. This is done using NCS setup command. So, uh, we already saw it in the installation guide NCS setup, but uh, this time we are going to do it in this directory so the da all database is going to be just in this directory so we have to do the following so we do ncs setup and i tend to actually type my everything myself so my hands remember okay destination dot okay let me also copy this and let's Try to understand what what it does. Uh, okay, so you provide a directory with your net sim. Let, let's actually do this. Let's actually first look on what was created. So we have directory net sim, uh, and it has file it has C, C 
zero. Okay, and there are some start, stop, and status scripts. There is conf d stuff and conf d conf. Let me see what is conf d conf. This is some stuff. This is like console port, management port, prompt, blah blah blah. Okay, this is not exactly what I'm looking for. Uh, what else do they have here? So we have netconf log, global data environment sh, audit log, CLI ssh. Honestly, I'm looking for the actual config file. Uh, I guess it's here in ISXML. Let's see. ISXML. Yeah, here it is. So, you see, they. You, actually, it's pretty, pretty funny here. Uh, so, this is IS config, but you see it's in XML using their Yank model all already but remember what we did we did show run and it showed us typical is style config i'm scrolling here yeah but all of this config was described in this their abstract model in this xml file so this is an actual structured data unlike is config so they generate as config from this structured data. Uh, okay, let me see what else do they have here. Okay, another device have something and so on. I really like exploring some directories that are created for you automatically. Uh, let's also have a AAA init or like this. Because I always you know, when there is some magic going on, I don't feel comfortable because I don't understand the magic, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm not 100% sure what this is. This seems to be like some kind of API endpoints for users. I don't know what that is. Okay. Okay, let's go let's go ahead and continue. Okay. So we provided directory with all of the netsim structure. Oh, there is another thing that I am wondering. And this is I'm wondering if there is topology defined somewhere. Maybe this file. Let's do this. Um, let's see. Oops. Okay, let's see what is happening here. Actually, no, they, there is no topology, I guess. Or maybe there is something I just didn't find. find. They just specify that, okay, all the management ports, how you connect to this kind of instance and all that stuff. Um, I don't see here like an actual topology, like C0 is connected to C1 and so on. Okay, so you provide this NetSim directory and you say where you're going to create this uh, NSO stuff, NSO configuration database. So let's look on the directory right now. It's more or less empty except of netsim folder. So now I'm running this one. And there should be a bunch of files here. Okay, so now we now have NCS conf, we have NCS CDB, we have packages, we have scripts, we have state. I don't know yet every all of this, but we'll figure it out. Okay, so now in the folder where you have ncsconf, you can actually run ncs command, and this will start uh, this will start uh, NSO basically in the background. Uh, so I s ncs. 
Okay. So it takes some time. Let me check if there are some comments. Uh, okay, there are some 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 good information here from Jumpy Rabbit. Uh, so it's basically a management agent implementation for networking devices to support NetConfiang. That team is using that agent to simulate devices. There is a basic version of that agent anyone can download and use in their networking devices. The config should be in CDB folder, no topology, net sim is config only, doesn't have interfaces for connection, only in configuration, so a topology doesn't make sense. Okay, great. Thank you very much for this explanation, this really helps. I was really wondering if they somehow like put topology, but yeah, it doesn't make sense if it's only configuration daemon basically. Okay, so yeah, it took like 20 seconds or so to run this. Now, all of the interaction, well, if you want to use uh, NCS CLI, you basically use this um, NCS underscore CLI command. So this is basically an SO CLI. So you can specify either minus C for Cisco style. Oh, it's Cisco XR style. Or you can specify minus J and you will do Juniper modification. Okay, so let's also see, let's do one on this, um, one. okay, what are the different options, uh, IP, I don't understand this. Why I don't see like these two options minus C minus J? <sighs> okay, I will just I will just use them. Okay, so uh, let me see. And I'm also going to uh, create a copy of this tab. Uh, in the same folder and we'll go to the same folder so we can actually connect to the device and connect to the NSO. Okay, so previously we were uh, we were connecting using NCS net sim let's do this history grab NCS uh, net sim oh wow uh, I have spelling issue we are connecting using NCS net sim CLI. This is like you are actually connecting to the specific device. This is like emulation of that. Now we are connecting to an actual NSO management console. Okay. So NCS underscore CLI minus C minus U admin. Okay. So now we are on the NSO CLI admin and at CS. Uh, we will show commands in Cisco XR style. Okay, so what you can do. This point in NSO only knows address port authentication information. This management information was loaded to NSO by the setup utility. Interesting. It also tells NSO, okay, makes sense. So because we provided this directory, it went ahead and read the appropriate uh, file, I think that um, netsim info or something, and it read address port and authentication info about devices, so it now knows how to connect to devices. For an actual devices, we don't provide this, so we would need to add those devices somehow differently. It also tells in the so how to communicate with devices using netconf as an MP Cisco SCLI. Also, at this point, the actual configuration of the individual devices is unknown. So if you want to, you, to, to see the config, you need to do show running config uh, devices device. 
Okay, you see this syntax devices device. Basically, this will be always our selector uh, because we want to. Well, because we are managing a bunch of devices, we would like to say on which device we would like to get the config. Okay, so if we are doing this, it's basically the running config as NSO knows right now. Doesn't contain those IP addresses and BGP config that was there yet. Because we didn't do any kind of synchronization procedure yet. So it right now knows only like port and address and and stuff like this. So not much. Okay. Let me also copy this. Um, Okay, so you can also specify like the actual device to sh see only one, like devices, device and device name. Uh, or if you don't provide, it will be listed for everything. I think I can also... Okay. I'll just leave it. Okay, uh, okay. let's analyze and so manage a list of devices. Each device is reached by device Devices, device, device name. You can use standard type completion in the CLI. Interesting. Let's actually just, just make sure it works. So running devices, device. Yeah, so, so it's all type completion. And it actually shows me possible device names. It's, it's kind of cool. Um, okay. So manages list of devices. There is support fields test tells NSO where to connect to the device. For now, they all live in local host. Device type structure tells, tells us that it is a CLI device and specific CLI supported by the uh, network element driver Cisco S. Okay, so if you look here closely, you see that this is CLI, and to, in order to interact with this, we need to use NAND Cisco S. So you need to provide a package Cisco S. More detailed explanation how to configure device blah 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 will be later okay so they say now let's just connect to them okay so it says connected 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 to three of them and so does it need to have connections active continuously Send and so will establish a connection connection when needed and connections are pulled to conserve resources. At this time and so can read configurations from the devices and populate configuration CDP. Okay. So now we establish connection, we can actually synchronize our local configuration database with, with the config that is present there. Um, let me go ahead here as well and do NCS NetSIMP CLI. CLI, CLI C0 and enable, enable, no, just show run. Uh, what is going on? Um, show. Oh, this is Juniper style, excuse me. So CLI C. So it will be show run. So this is configuration that is present on this. Conf T. Uh, we are right now connected to device. Uh, remember, if I do show config devices device C0, what did I do wrong? Oh, show running config. Yeah, show running config devices device C0. The only thing that we have about this device is this connection details. We don't know anything about what is really on the device. So now we are doing device sync from. So we are taking whatever it is on the device through the, this net driver and convert this to as this abstract YAC model and put it in our local database. So now, I guess, before reading, let me see if I actually explained this correctly. And you can actually see that I did. So now I'm doing this show run devices device C1 and on top of this default style that we, we were having before, we also have 
community list, IP HTTP secure server, loopback, class map, policy map, BGP, all of this config that is present here, we now have in our local database. And if I remember correctly, there is this option display and you can display it in any kind of format. For example, you can display it in JSON. So you have all this config in structured JSON form. Uh, you can have it in XML. You have this in XML. It's almost like, yeah, well, it's basically Yank model just represented, the data represented in, in XML. What else do they have here? So, curly braces. Okay, this is a okay. This is Juniper Juniper style curly braces. So you can present this config now any way you want. Let me see if there are any any uh, comments. There are some. Okay. Let's see. Is config only? No. You can configure interfaces, but they don't do anything. Small minus is IS style. I think doesn't seem like it. Okay. Can you? you can you switch CLI on NetSim devices? I know there is something like that in NetCS and SO, so you don't have to lo log out, log in. Uh, okay. Let's do this. So, switch CLI. I guess you don't have this kind of option directly where you are there. And it kind of makes sense because you kind of like already connected to the ConfD and you get a feeling of like that system, right? On NSO you have like a management station so you can you can change config style. So you're saying that there is switch CLI. Nice. And there is show config I guess. So now I have devices, device C0. Okay, so now I switch to Juniper style and I have curly braces. Pretty neat, huh? So let me also add a switch CLI. Uh, so switch CLI to change between uh, Cisco IOS and Juniper style CLI in NSO. Okay, sure. Uh, okay. So let's let's re oh let's. Let's do what? Well, we actually showed the devices, device C0. We now actually have all of this config that was present on ConfD. So let's just read the text to make sure that we didn't miss anything. Um, sorry, guys, if this is boring, but I also like, since I'm learning this, I also want to make sure that I also understand exactly what is going on. So not to be just a monkey who which types commands in the CLI but also to make sure that I understand how what is going on in the backend. Um, okay, so it's an SO data store, it will store for every device that pass this, everything after this pass is configuration of the device. And so keeps it synchronized. Synchronization is managed by the phone principle. First we discover config Then you change config somehow using CLI web UI or REST. You commit them as transaction to the actual devices only if all change. Aha, uh -huh, interesting. So also you get actually network-wide transactions out of the box. So whenever you do any kind of change, uh, and then you do commit if it you, you this change will happen only if it, if it can happen on every single device. It's pretty cool. It actually transaction also covers devices so if any of the device participating in transaction fails and so will roll back configuration changes on all the modified devices this works even in the case of devices do not have, have native support rollback like cisco scli pretty neat huh so even if you have cisco S device which doesn't support rollback if an so config up, uh, commit fails it will rollback even though uh, ISCLI doesn't support rollback. 
and second detect out of band changes and reconcile them by either updating CDB or modify config on devices to reflect the currently stored config. Okay, so this means that if you change the devices uh, without NSO, then you have two options. You can either synchronize these changes to database or you can rewrite changes on the device, which makes sense. Uh, because the device will be in this unsync state. So, and so only needs to synchronize in the event of change being made outside of NSO. Changes made using NSO will be reflected in both CDB and devices. So, the phone actions don't... Aha, uh -huh, okay. So, whenever you do config change using NSO, you don't need to do sync from. Makes sense. Yeah, I would like to have some good resources on NSO. Uh, when I just go to developer hub, I don't know what is good and what what should I read first and what I shouldn't. It's about sequence mm -hmm. Okay, so Nodes part interfaces in NSO, they modify config in NSO data store. NSO calculates a minimum diff between the current config and the new config. Gives only the changes to config to the nets that runs the command on device. As a single change set. Okay, this is what I was describing before. So whenever you do any config change, it compares, it, it, cal it calculates diff for the Yank model in their uh, data store and then takes this div and converts it to actual CLI commands using that. Okay, so, okay, you modify config. With, mm -hmm. There is, I think, one thing that I explained incorrectly before. I said that whenever you do change, it goes ahead on the current device, sees the difference, uh, and calculates D from what is on the device compared to what you want to achieve. From what I understand right now, it's actually not true. It compares the previous state in the database to the new state of the database and pushes this, but only if the change is synchronized. Uh, okay, we, we use this command, but I didn't use the config part. So let's actually use this config part. I don't know how it's different. Aha, uh -huh, okay, makes sense. So, with just this one, I was also showing these connection details on the top, but with the keyword config at the very end, it just shows an actual config. Okay, good. Uh, and you can also specify any kind of... <laughs> nice, they actually have some interesting syntax here. So you can specify that I would like to see only IS policy map, for example, section. Nice. Or I would like to see the section only on, on every single device, for example. I think that's pretty slick. Let me save this to my notes as well. Okay. So show a particular piece of configuration from all devices. Um, this will achieve the same thing, I guess. Since I, yeah, the same thing. Okay. So like and pipe commands try to up after pipe to see different pipe targets. Okay. Append begin best effort contact count CSV. I don't know, this is not CSV. Oh, but this is not table, okay. Details, display, height, include, much over, much more, no more, repeat. Okay, let's just have include. Uh, let's have config, include, uh, let's say policy map. Okay, so yeah, this is typical AS yes style. But also they have this display XML. I already showed it to you before. Oh. And you can then save this to a file. That's pretty cool. Let's actually do this. 
So um, let's do devices C0. Uh, let's do IS a router section display XML save as uh, C1 routing XML. Uh, why does this didn't work? Oh, okay, because I didn't provide the word config. So this saved somewhere. I guess it will be in the same folder. Let me exit and check. Okay, here is this file. Let me actually see this. So this actually extracted part of this Yank model specifically for the C0 device. You see that this config contains only router. So pretty cool. Okay, we did that. In order to change configuration, enter configure mode. Okay, now we are doing change from NSO. So config. Let me log in to one of the devices. Show run. So we are going to change, we are going to configure a new neighbor, okay? On a bunch of devices. So you say devices, device, C0 to config IS IS router BGP 64512 neighbor 10 10 10 remote IS 64502 ah, okay So now we did that. It's important to understand how NSO applies config. All changes are local to NSO. So okay, since since CDB is in sync, we can calculate the diff. Okay, so let's see. Top. Okay, it goes to the previous level. Now show config. And it shows the new changes and they say okay this is change is going to be after two three four five it's going to be here nice uh, okay it's possible to dry run the changes okay I will do all of these nodes not weird for XR folks but I haven't seen out format before <laughs> format native okay so okay this is just showing what is going to be applied now we can commit these changes to all of the devices and there are a bunch of commit options as well And so stores a rollback file for every commit so that the whole transaction can be rolled back manual. The following is an example of a rollback. Okay, so let's do commit. Commit details. Okay. So I just understand this line, I don't understand everything else. Okay, so if this worked, um, I should be able to see my new BGP neighbor on this guy. 
which I, I have here. So, oops, let's do. I have here. I think this is even this part is pretty cool. Like, you can do atomic change for all of your network like this. Okay, let me see if there are any comments. Uh, there is a CLI context matches are really nice. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, okay. I'm also going to uh, add another session here as well. Clone, clone session. Um, So uh, commit should be saved in the log folder uh, and I have a bunch of commits here. Hmm. Okay, so I guess this is the one. So cat logs this one. Okay, and this was the, the, that commit that we were pushing. Okay. You can also show this commit from from the CLI. Okay, let me also save this as well. All uh, row packs are stored in logs folder. There's something in the beginning. Let's just look on the last one. Okay, this is. Mm -hmm. So, this is interesting. So, we did commit, but if we doing this command based on that commit, it actually says if you're going to apply this, this is what, what is going to happen. So, we are. This is basically a reverse operation. So in order to get the previous state, you need to delete this, delete that, delete that, and and so on and so forth. And now actually this part, using this net driver, is going to be converted to the actual CLI commands if you are going to do rollback. I think that's that's pretty cool. Um, excuse me, guys. Um, Okay, let's do rollback. Be advised. Okay, so now, uh okay, now we are in the candidate config. So this config this config is not applied yet. Uh, where is my net team? Churn section PG. Mm -hmm. So now I go ahead and commit my rollback. And my config is gone. Perfect. Nice. Okay. There are some debugging data here as well. A trace, trace log can be created to see what is going on between an SO and device CLI and enable trace for this. Okay. Since we are learning everything, I'm actually, first of all, I'm actually pretty satisfied with this tutorial. Um, and I really like how they explain what is going on on the back end and how to debug this. I think that that's awesome.
me as a tech engineer, I'm always curious, well, as ex tech engineer, I'm always curious about all of these details, what is going on. I don't trust in magic, you know? <laughs> okay, so enable trace. Okay, so if you need to do that, I need to say devices, global settings, trace. These commands are pretty lengthy, so it's always have to good to have say a reference somewhere. Okay, and now show config. Uh huh. Okay. Now I commit. Okay. Trace settings only take effect for a new connection, so it's important to disconnect the current connections. Okay, makes sense. Device disconnect. Okay, device connect. Okay, and now devices. Device. C0 config is interface fast Ethernet one two IP hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, fast Ethernet one two it's auto completion everywhere. Nice. I think that's that's weak. Uh, okay, so we will need to see show run interface. So we don't have the interface F12. So I'm going to apply this and I'm going to say commit try run out format native. I will need to save this command as well. How to do config changes. Okay, so this is what is going to be applied. Now I can commit this. Okay, commit is done. So this device should have the new config now, which it doesn't. Mm, let's just do run. Oh, okay. Y yeah, I'm just an idiot. Uh, the device is C0. Show run interface. Here it is, perfect. So now we have this, and now to commit try run. Hmm. There is also a reverse flag, which you can see how to roll back. Wow. Also close this session. So and they saying that there should be a lock at locks net space C0 trace. Okay, I'm not one hundred percent sure how to read this yet. Okay, it's doing terminal length zero, terminal terminal width zero. Show version. Okay.
Okay, there are some additional stuff here, device groups. Okay, well, so far everything seems to be understandable. Mm. Yeah, but maybe later we will, will be in more trouble. So yeah, I mean, so far everything seems to be pretty straightforward. Um, yes, there is this, you know, some additional syntax that that is needed, but that makes sense because you need to select a particular device from an Uh Let's okay. Let's see these device groups. Uh, I will also make notes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this seems to be something like just groups in Ansible. Basically, you have a group with just a number of devices. Um, okay, let's let's create this. device group core so okay this is the name of the group I guess core or device name uh, or interesting so you can also create group from another groups okay this is like typical ansible basically in this case just and you specify that which device you want to have cool you also need to commit even those kind of changes interesting and here they create group all group all device name c2 device group core okay makes sense okay and now you can do show show run full config devices device group this didn't work interesting I was able to do this. Okay, show device device group. Okay, this is here. Device groups can contain different devices as well as devices from different vendors. Configuration changes will be committed to each device in its native language without needing to be adjusted in an SO. Okay. Okay. So now we actually checking if uh, if we are in sync. And I guess the next exercise will be we do some change on the device, but not through NSO. So check if the device is in sync. Okay. So uh, let's do this device, and I I can say just check sync for all of them. Okay. Or I can say devices device group core ah, checks in. Okay, it says it's in sync. Okay, 
Device templates, okay. We'd like to manage permit lists across devices. This can be achieved by defining templates and implies them to device groups. The following CLI sequence defines a tiny template called community list. Let's see. But I'm, you know, the more I learn about this, I, the more I enjoy <laughs> interacting with this. Like, even this kind of small stuff, right? Like, basically, the idea here is that you have the same kind of config on multiple devices. You create a template, and then you apply this template to group. It makes so much sense, right? Like, um, what's typical use case? Uh, for example you do bgp with route reflector right it's it's boilerplate config almost everywhere where you have to peer with your rr um and you could create this device templates right device template p or like bg bgp minus p or something where it's just snippet which configures bgp with rr so so much easier and then you apply it across all the devices Kind of like, you know, like advanced copy paste basically. And we didn't even get to like a real power of NSO where, you know, we want to have this network configuration automation in declarative style and services, all this stuff yet. So I think that's awesome. Oh, I had a typo. Okay, so show full configuration devices, device group. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Do you know if a specific template language is used? It's, a, it's just XML against the Yank representation internet. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, let's just well, I will just retype this and I will add it to my notes as well. Really want to have all of the commands available at any time without referencing this web page. Um, and I always tend well, I almost always tend to actually retype them manually uh, because this is how I remember stuff. <laughs> Muscle memory. Uh, okay. Actually, I learned this technique from one of the guys um, who wrote the book "Learn Py Learn Python the Hard Way," and he also uh, wrote the book called "Learn C the Hard Way." Um, because for my master degree that I am doing, I actually need to learn C. So I was doing that and he has this very, he has very specific style, but basically his old book is do not ever copy, copy paste this code. Even if it's like one page long, just rewrite everything. So it will be easier for you to understand and to remember. So I started actually applying this kind of concept for, for a lot of stuff and it actually helped me a lot. Even though it's boring to retype the commands that you see on the screen, that you can just copy paste. It really, in your muscle memory and you start, you know, and it really helps with understanding as well. Um, okay. Okay, so I'm going to retype it here. So we are creating, aha, uh -huh, template are not, what is the template I'm not? Oh, okay, this is a name of the template. Okay. Now config. Nice. That's pretty awesome. Um, standard test. Test one. Permit. 
and and for everything you have auto completion. That's awesome. Nice. Um, Jumpy Rabbit, I have a question for you, by the way. Um, do you know what happens if you if you have some kind of config on the device that is that was not described in the net model net net driver net package whatever that is right so you have some kind of very obscure config and this translation is not present so what happens then and can you do actually something about it or no that what is there a way to extend this so is there a way to actually manually somehow extend the net package um, and how hard or easy it is so I discovered some kind of config flag that is not supported. Can I actually implement this? And what would it take to extend? Let's try to do this. Um, I'm not 100% sure where they are stored. Actually, I think I, I, I have an idea. Um, so I think there is packages which should be seen linked to Cisco S. <laughs> oh, this directory stru structure is funny. Okay, so we're seeing.
I okay I understand Yank model so I am not I saw big big Yang models before and I understand how to work with them but I'm also trying to understand how is CLI described for this like you have this Yank model but how does it translate this to the next shell command which says X Y that I don't see this here. Maybe I'm just not looking in the right place. I don't know. Like I understand this Yank model. How you can get it from the resource Yank file describing CLI structure and then Java code. So I guess okay. I I guess this is just Yank, correct? So. Yank would not contain the info about the command. So the info about the command will be actually in the code, correct? So the actual code that you need to apply to be able to do whatever you are supposed to do. I guess. That's a lot of stuff. Actually, I'm willing to go back to see in the Java code. Um, so I guess it should be CRC, SRC, com, TLF, packages, net, Cisco, S, IS, net, CLI, student spaces. IS this guy is Java. I will regret looking here. I will totally regret. Fortunately I know I barely know Java. I was programming in it before, but not for a long time. Okay, this is just some declarative style with just a bunch of variables. I'm really interested, where are the commands? Like, I'm very curious. Okay, this Java code doesn't seem to be big. Session expert. Okay, th no, this part is actually how you connect to the device. This is what this is. So, like how you connect and apply config, but I don't think the an actual config is here. Maybe I missed it somewhere, but I don't know. This doesn't seem like a lot of code, a lot of Java code. This is just connecting to the device and applying config, really. But not list of comments. This sort of patch the commas together from the Yang files. Are you saying that basically the structure of Yang model is converted to com like commands themselves? For example, if Yang container is named interface, then we will use the CLI. Is this what you're saying? Okay, no. no. I'm today on my first NSO stream. I'm not willing to to, to go that deep. Okay, so 
we created here config template uh, I don't think it was applied anywhere sure on uh, the risk community list but it should be standard test one okay it's not applied yet but because I just created it we have to apply it we have to apply it to the device or device group okay devices device group core apply template template name and community list okay I really like the auto completion for everything. That's awesome. Okay, let's look if there was something here. Oh, I don't see it. Oh, I did. Okay. I applied it, but I didn't commit it yet. So if I do show config, I have this here. So I do commit dry run out format. Native. Okay, and now I do commit. Okay. And now I have this here. Awesome. What if the device group core contain different vendors? Since the configuration is written in AES, the above template would not work. This part I kinda understand, but also I don't. I mean, I want to have template. Oh, okay, I see it now. You have here part for Junas and part for iOS. Interesting. So actually, I'm wrong, okay? Because I thought you actually have vendor independent Yank model. But actually, you still have vendor dependent model, even though it's abstract, because they are directly converted to the commands. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. This is a little bit unfortunate. Okay, let's see what this command does. Mm, not here, here. Okay, net comes with yank. Okay, we we explore this. This renders an SO data store schema and SO CLI web UI SO bus commands. Okay. Show run devices device C0 config IS IP community list. To control, control of templates shall merge the list or replace the list. Interesting. This is managed via tags. Default behavior of the templates is to merge config. But tags can be inserted at any point in the template. The values are merged, replace, delete, create, and no create. Awesome. This is. I am. Yes, I am. <laughs> I'm glad. This is so cool. This actually, if you have ever done netconf before, in netconf you can specify an attribute operation and you have operation merge, replace, delete, create. I don't know about no create yet, but 
this is very similar so you, you that's cool this is just cool uh, so okay, default behavior here is merge but you can specify docs anywhere Okay, this is what we have, but what we really want to have is only one. Okay. Let's do this show. Mm -hmm. Show full config, devices template. Nice, tag add. This is would be useful for that example with uh, usernames, right? So you could just specifies that you would like to replace usernames that's awesome okay so tag add devices template community list config and I say him community list replace uh, commit and then okay and now we have here tag replace so on the level of community list basically every community list will be replaced with what we have here nice okay so i committed this I have the config now i say devices device c0 apply template template name community list and i say commit and I go here again and I look on community lists and I broke everything oh no it's alright here only one community list is present awesome okay merge replace Okay, just knows. Okay, I need to have reference here. Great, it does not exist. error. No create. template can have different tags along the tree problem is about template is that every value is hard coded what if you wanted a template where the community list name and permit list where permit list value are variables passed to the template when applied any part of template can be a variable or actually x pass expression you can wow nice so you can even for these templates you just can have variables inside of the CLI okay I think this is going to be my favorite toy for the next week I was I really didn't know like what to expect until I did some hands-on but this seem, seems to be like so much fun uh,
Oops. Okay. I think I'm going to finish this part and we will wrap up for today. So we're already going for three hours, three hours. What did I do wrong? Ah, just don't do it. Okay, so what do you offer here? Show full config. Mm. I'm not used to this. Similar, even though it's not very far from my uh, style, but. So the template now requires two parameters when applied. Okay, let's try this. Devices, device group, all apply, template, template name, community list variable. Okay, so variable is a new thing, right? And then it says variables. And there is auto completion everywhere. Uh, underscore uh, value uh, let's do stream um, let's do variable uh, what is wrong what is wrong Uh, what? Uh huh, okay, I need the space before curly brace. Uh, so, okay, name, name. And now it understood that I already provided one, so it auto filled another one. Awesome. Okay, so let's just have one. Let's do commit and let's do show run. Here it is. Stream permit one two. What is that replace tag was still part of the template and it would delete any existing community list, which is probably not the desired outcome in general case. Template doesn't have a memory of what happened to the network which device it touched. A user can modify templates. Uh, there is one part that bothers me a little. The template had a tag. It had a tag replace, but I don't see that config was replaced. Um, it's just tag replace. Oh, 
on community list. This part doesn't. This part bothers me. I don't see why. Why is this? Why this didn't get deleted? If it's replace. And this is what is set here. Okay. That it's supposed to replace. Okay, I don't think I will be able to answer this question right now unless someone from the audience know. Okay, let's see. Um, there were a bunch, bunch of messages and I missed everything. Okay, let me go through the old stuff here. Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure if you have to really understand that it's benefit of buying the product. <laughs> Engineering me can can't stand if I don't understand something. Um, especially if I want to do some cust customization. Like for example, I started playing with Ansible and applying to like our business problem and almost on like the second day we realized that we have to write our custom modules <laughs> because we can't solve the problem with just building stuff. Um, okay, you have an option to look at it, it's just another package like the ones you write for services yourself. Said that shared services models recently which go in the direction of standardized model, but open config ITF are not even remotely co close to mature young model base. Yeah, you are correct. Open uh, well with open config Google is pushing whatever they need for, for their network. But it's obviously not really complete for for enterprise, for example. Or do you know if there will be a net for DNA? Uh, oh, great question. I think you meant DNA center, right? Uh, there is one already. Um, I don't think I can show to you that it pre it's present, but yes, yeah, so it, it's part of the it's part of the project right now. Well, you can you can download it. The vendor is also supporting that. I think you can check the list of vendor as he has access. Yeah, I have, I have, um, I have access to our internal repo where I can see what packages are present or not. So, if you are wondering about some specific uh, package, I can check right now. But you need to let me know before we close the stream. They basically have the policy to develop if you ask them for it for about eight weeks development time for a new device tab if you know what features you want. Wow, that's actually pretty fast for something like this. Here's some listed but currently not DNA. Okay, I know for a fact that uh, you can you can control DNA center right now because I saw the module. Um, okay, I, that said, I'm not sure why you would want to do that though, but you can maybe. I don't know, maybe I, ju I just can't imagine the use case for it. Uh, let's continue. What else? I know about production grade hardware, for example, which is not on the list either. Oh, production grade hardware. Okay. Let me see. Didn't you say, didn't you say you have to work with it the next week anyway? Yes, I have to, I have to, well, I will have to learn everything I have to learn next week but I, I'm not going to steam that uh, so because I will have to apply directly to my project but on the next stream I hope I will be able to show something more interesting wait until you write your first service package I was actually I actually saw service package some people show, show, showed them to me and yeah I mean they're not extremely like friendly friendly but um, but um, since I know Yank pretty well, it helps. 
actually I was doing um, for the Krakow Cisco office, I was doing a training on Netcon, Frescon, Fiank and some of the people who came to this training were actually people who were working in a supporting and a so because they wanted to learn more about Yank. Um, so, yeah. But yeah, I guess it's it's not going to be like, oh, let, let me spend five minutes on this and it's done. Uh, CLI generated from the internal Yank models. Basically, this kind of is a collection of infinite Yank models. They may have the system. Okay, for 40,000 bucks you can. Yeah, so actually, yeah. Especially easy, easy Yank Python template making parts. Maybe, we'll see. I don't think from the first attempt I will be able to do that, but I'm also not really scared either, since, yeah, I know Python pretty well, like, more than six years of Python experience, and I have been using Yank for quite a while, so I feel confident, even though it's completely a new product for me. Um, okay, so, you know what, there is one part that I want to show and try before we close the stream. I want to apply out-of-band changes, even though it's right here. I want to do this and see what, what will happen. Uh, very quickly, let's just have... Okay, five minutes for this. So, uh, we want to have, I don't know, router EAGRP1. They don't have router EAGRP here? Let's do router OSPF. One. Uh, let's do network. Network ten zero 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 zero. Area zero. Okay. Uh, commit. Yes. So I committed changes. So I guess now, if I would like to change something here, it will yell at me. And rightfully so. So I say devices device. C0. I want to change something else. I want to config. Let's do iOS banner. IS banner. Banner MOTD. Um, some banner. Okay. And then now do conf commit and it I think it's supposed to yell at me. Alarm out of sync. Alarm out of sync. Awesome. Um so I guess in order to do that I will need to do uh I will not be able to commit. Yeah. I will need cancel I don't know any commands. Uh so I will need to do devices seeing from okay uh, now my change with OSPF should be gone now um, show run router I forgot that I need to have this. Oh, I did sync from. It's okay, makes sense. So actually, it's not supposed to be deleted. Uh, so now this is synced. So now I should be able to say show config. No, I'm not good at this. <laughs> so full config? No. Show devices. No, I think it was show run devices device c0 config. Okay, so now OSPF is part of here, so I can go ahead and say uh, devices device c0 config is banner MOTD hello. Hello there. Streaming live. Ok. 
Okay, to meet. I just have one word. Nice. Thank you. I hope this will work. Please work, please work. Okay, no, I will just change something else. I'm not ready to troubleshoot this right now, so let's just change something else. Oh, let's have I guess. <laughs> Brock net. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is the loopback zero description? We have a description. Okay, so from zero to two party characters. Okay, this should work. Famous last words. Uh, live streaming from Poland. Okay, yeah. Woohoo! So now show run. Ah. Nice. Well, not nice. Whites. Oh, it doesn't like this character! <laughs> Exclamation mark. Okay then, but that's okay. So, what we did w uh, was we um, we did some change out of band. Then we were trying to do commit, and commit were saying, "Well, you're not out of sync, so you can't commit anything. So, do work." And there are two options you can either sync from so that local changes are overwritten by whatever it is on the device or you can do sync to so the latest known version of the database of cdb will be pushed to the device um, overwriting whatever changes were there um, and then you can go back to doing commits right and so 
Okay, makes sense. So, makes sense. Um, seems pretty, pretty straightforward. Okay, uh, so let's have a quick summary of the whole today's stream. Uh, and then we will wrap up. If you still have any questions, let me know in the chat while we'll st we are still online. So, so um, on this stream, we started discussing and looking on NSO, which is a product developed by Cisco, previously TLF. And this is a tool that can manage uh, network configuration state unlike a lot of other network automation tool out there like um, like Ansible, like uh, like Salt and some other tools. So the main the main difference is that we have first we have a da database where you uh, write all of your changes um, and the so operates with the uh, abstract Yank mo data model that they created. Uh, in order to talk to the device, they use what is called NET, Network Element Driver, and basically this is a module, uh, Java module, uh, it seems to be plus Yank model, which describes uh, the, the config on specific vendor OS and how to apply it. So in Java, they basically written um, connection via SSH and pushing config change and so on. So what they actually doing, they're taking running config on the device, convert them to Yank model, and they store this data in Yank model in the configuration database. Uh, and you are, as a user, you're interacting with this database uh, and you get some nice properties like uh, in order to do a new change, Whenever you push it, it calculates difference between the current and the previous state and what kind of an extra command should be pushed there. Um, and uh, it pushes them to the device when you commit them, uh, only changes basically. Um, this this I think pretty cool. Another important thing that we learned but we didn't see yet is uh, services so you can create your own Yank model describing the service uh, and um, which you populate with variables uh, and you basically it will apply some kind of config across a bunch of devices. Uh, we saw that CLI can be both Cisco style CLI and Juniper style CLI whatever you prefer inside of NSO. You can also interact via web UI. Uh, we didn't see web UI today. You can also interact with REST API. Uh, so those are your options. Uh, you have auto completion everywhere for every single thing. So including like names of your prefix lists and so on and so forth. So that's pretty cool. We also saw that you can create templates you can create templates with variables as well. Uh, these are just snippets of the config which could be applied on per group or per device basis um, where you could populate some variables. Uh, so this could be, this, uh, I mean, service is uh, much higher on abstraction ladder. I would say it's high level, high level abstraction. Device template is something lower level, something in between individual configs and the service. Uh, this is my perspective on this. Um, all of your config is structured, even though you can see it as IIS or Junos, you can see it any way you want. You can see it with Juniper style, with XML, JSON, whatever that is. Uh, they do support typical netconf operations like merge, replace, delete, create uh, on every level. So. Uh, that seems to be uh, interesting as well. And I th oh, and another interesting part is NetSIM as well, right? So NetSIM is shipped directly with NSO and it's a system which creates emulated devices, emulated CLI parser basically. Uh, so it's very lightweight uh, way to kind of test NSO. Uh, so you don't even have to bring up your virtual devices 
uh, during your development phase or something. Um, okay, so there, there is one comment also NetConf API for NSO. You can talk to NetConf. Uh, why NetConf is NSO? I didn't know that. that that's good. Um, that said, I would prefer REST API though. Um, so usually, well, it's very widely known as a um, service provider product. So a bunch of service providers use NSO. I also know for a fact that um, um, the Viptela, the companies that Cisco bought recently, for is divan for vmanage, they use actually NSO internally to push any kind of config changes to their uh, V edges. Um, for example, in internal prong horn uses net constant integrate with NSO. This D Cloud Lab for that product. Okay, I know I don't know nothing about that. Um, Disclaimer, and it seems not always 100 the same device, but mostly. Yeah, it makes sense. And it seems just virtual emulation of, of config, of CLI parser. So obviously it, you know, it's not exactly the same as Cisco S or Junos or whatever that is. It's just a tool, lightweight tool to, uh, to have your, um, that you use during development, basically. Okay, I think that pretty much wraps up what we did and discussed today. Um, so, the plan for the next stream is to continue talking about NSO and showing you some cool stuff. I do hope that I will be able to integrate NSO with this lab that I have here. Um, so during the next week, I'm going to actually learn actively in SO because I need it for my work project. Um, so I, yeah, I do hope that next stream I will actually come with, with much more experience that I had today because uh, the actual doing some hands-on with an SO, I started today just one hour before the stream to make sure I can install it. So that that today is my first time touching an SO. Um, my like personal impression, I actually, I'm actually pretty impressed with with what they offer. Um, so a lot of interesting stuff here, um, and so far, so far, it wasn't as difficult as I thought it was, because you know I heard some feedback that it's actually pretty hard to start. So I. So far, it doesn't seem that way as long as you follow the guide and you try to understand what is going on. So, yeah, um, I have good good impressions about this, and I will continue learning this product. We'll see, we'll see in a in a week what I will end up with. So for today, thank you very much, guys, for sticking around with me. I do hope it was uh, useful for you. Uh, and the, uh, the recording is going to be published probably tomorrow. And today, again, a reminder that in a couple of hours after I wrap up with the stream, my presentations page on my website is going to be completely changed and all of my presentations will be there. There will be one IPsec one that no one really has seen before yet. So if if you need some kind of quick reference about IPsec, make sure you check that out. So again, thank you very much and until next time. Thank you, bye.